United States dollars budget loot by the government of former president Lucia Gwabasanjo Maru Musa Yaradwa. Good luck, Billy Jonathan and Muhammad Buhari. The courts ordered the government of President Bolatinibu to quote disclose the exact amount of money stolen by General Senior Bacha from Nigeria and the total amount of a Bacha loot recovered and all agreements signed on same by the government of former President Basanjo Yaradwa, Jonathan and Buhari. And the court. This judgment was delivered last week by Justice James Kolawole Motoshaw following a freedom of information suit brought by the Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project Serap. And in this judgment, Justice Motoshaw held that, quote, in the final analysis, the application by Serap is meritorious and the federal government, through the Minister of Finance, is hereby ordered to furnish Sarap with the full spending details of about five billion dollars to batch loot within seven days of this judgment in the court on the program to talk about this uh, this beautiful morning is a senior researcher at budgets viola quagga good morning to you viola and thanks for being on the program hello viola good morning all right um, so let's try to connect with Viola again. Uh, Viola, if you're there, good morning to you. Good morning, Viola. Hi, good morning. All right, great. Good morning. Yeah, good morning to you. Uh, for a moment, we didn't get uh, one bit of what you said, but thank you so much for being on the program this morning. Thank you, sir. All right. Yeah. You're welcome. Appreciate it. All righty, again, Viola Quagga is a senior researcher at Budget, and uh, he'll be talking, speaking with us about this uh, subject this morning. Viola, uh, there's been a lot said about Bachelor Loot. As a matter of fact, if you are uh, very present on social media, if you know what I mean, but very active on social media, you find uh, some memes and quotes about uh, how uh, after many years, uh, Bachelor left not just Nigeria, but left this world. He's uh, kept. Uh, feeding the country, you know, in terms of recovered loot, and it's like your ancestor continually blessing you with so much, right? That that's uh, you know just a joke you find on social media. But to this landmark judgment from a federal high court in Abuja, uh, let let's track things back, right? And this goes this order is for the disclosure of the spending details of about five billion dollars of bachelor loots and it the, the judgment requires that the current administration provide details from the from 1999 from the administration of president uh lucia basonjo marumusi yaradwa good luck ability jonathan and muhammadu buari uh well what, what, let, let's let me begin with your your thoughts on this judgment and how or what this means for Nigeria yeah thank you thank you so much uh, Kingsley for that question and you know I'd like to start off by saying we cannot under understate the significance of this judgment uh, if you look at the uh, case number you will observe that it was instituted in 2020 yeah so this is something that has been on for, I guess, this should be getting to its third year. And, you know, it just got judgment uh, at this time. Uh, if you uh, had taken a little look, or for our uh, listeners who had taken a little look at the news piece, you would see that there were objections by the Ministry of Finance as to, you know, not having the information on the spending mm -hmm. and what have you. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really interesting that the... The learner justice was able to establish that not only was there a prima facie case, but that the federal government had a right to, or had a, had a duty, had an obligation to disclose this information. Uh, the the amount itself is, is staggering. I know as at 2020, last year, the, <laughs> the loot that had been recovered, so to say, was around 3.65 billion. So I suppose that between then and now, it has jumped to around $5 billion. <clears throat> I will say that it's also a, a victory for, for two issues, specifically the role and function of transparency regulations and the, the, the push 
by civil society and the media to ensure that information is put outside, put out there for Nigerians to be interested in and to act upon. Uh, why I say it's a victory for legislation is that the Freedom of Information Act is a consequential piece of legislation that may not even receive as much attention or may not be receiving as much attention as it should. Individual citizens in Nigeria need to understand that laws, legislation is meant to ensure order. And for the case of government activity, the Freedom of Information Act is primarily there to keep the government in check, to ensure that there are no abuses of power, not by overt actions, but even by inactions. In this case, not releasing information uh, that when due or when requests have been made. Uh, of course, I would commend uh, you know the organisation for profiling that case, and you know for for making the payments because legal fees are not are not cheap. I'm sure uh, the, your in-house counsel can tell you better about how lawyers charge. But you know, by and large, I, I think it's, it's actually a very good a good judgment, and I sincerely hope the federal government does not appeal. Hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, ju- just uh, talking about appealing um l- let me quickly read you uh, something uh part of the ruling the judgment by justice namoto shaw uh that judgment which uh, was taken on the 3rd of july that was last week uh well in that judgment he reads in part quote the failure of the minister of finance to write to Sarah informant by the way i just let me pause with the quote for a moment you would recall that i mentioned uh, while i was reading uh, during the introduction that this has to be within seven days of the judgment right so the minister of finance is required to present to set up details within seven days of judgment okay so just hold that and um yeah so back to that quote i was taking that the failure of the minister of finance so right to set up informing it of where the said information exists or to transfer the request to a public office who has uh, custody of such information is fatal to their case under section 5 of the freedom of information act and that the ministry cannot use a blanket statement that it was not in possession of the said records of about five billion uh, five billion dollars a batch of loot sold by setup the government failed to provide details of the projects executed with the money it also failed to provide locations of the projects and the names of the companies and contractors that carried out or are carrying out the projects funded with the money end of quote now i need to put that there uh, because this is where we're going to exactly why are we having this conversation why is this conversation fundamental nigerians deserve to know uh, what this monies have been used for and what they're being used for as stated that if their contracts have been done if their contracts are have not been done uh, or are being done now being carried out uh, with this fund what exactly that day uh, in your findings by uh of course again you're a senior researcher at budgets you followed you follow funds you follow budgets you follow uh, where these monies go and the rest uh, in your research what have you found are, are there any tangible things that we've done with this uh, recovered loot yeah, thank you so much for that question. I think it's it's always important that that Nigerians not only know how much money has been taken, mm. but they also know what the monies were used for. And this is still part of the drive for full disclosure, not just for the seizure or confiscation or forfeiture, but for actual usage. And as you know, Nigerians say, let the money that was let the stolen loot that was recovered not be subsequently stolen again mm. because there are always suspicions i mean the the level of, of trust between governments and citizens is is really not as high as it should be so the the challenge really with tracing the repatriation of these funds is there is no because there is no publicly documented system of how these funds are brought back into the system whether they are taken to the consolidated revenue fund or you know there is a there, there has to be a demand made by the minister of finance to the relevant agency that carried out the seizure the, this information is is really not known and i think relying on on rumors or hearsay really is not the way to go there there was once a news piece that said some of the recovered loot between, I think, 2020 or 2021, 2022, was used for the 
homegrown school feeding program. But, you know, this, these claims were never really verified. And I think the, the action by uh, Serap in getting the courts to enforce uh, the federal government to provide this information is just one step, uh, you know, out of numerous steps that have to be made in this business of disclosing information and giving Nigerians an, an idea as to where the monies go after they are seized, after they are confiscated or forfeited by these um, by these agencies. Right. I will say that the uh, proceeds of crime bill uh, mandates several several government agencies to establish uh, special directorates within their within their organizations to go after this money and seize it. However, there's a process from which these organizations will then remit to either the uh, accountant general's office or perhaps you know, coming from a, uh, a warrant from the uh, uh, minister herself or himself, you know, before this money is taken. And of course, the Money Laundering uh, 2020 Act also provides the creation of a special unit within the EFCC. Mm. Now, does this unit have to also liaise with the Minister of Finance first before this money is sent to the Consol- Consolidated Revenue Fund? Or is there a special fund, you know, within which these uh, monies are received? The information is extremely scanty. Hmm. Uh, all right, Bala, just a little bit of, let's just backstep a little bit and let's look at the Freedom of Information Act. That act was, you know, enacted and was signed into law in 2000, 20, 2011 by the, the admission of President Goodluck Jonathan. And like you had rightly said, it is to ensure that um, public offices and officials are accountable, you know, to uh, the public. But I just want to read some certain portions of that particular act. If you check section, uh, section one of that act, specifically says that notwithstanding anything contained in any act or any other act, law or regulation, the right of any person to access or request information whether or not contained in any written form which is in the custody or possession of any public official agency or institution howsoever described is established so section one gives us the general overview to say all public um, officials whatever document is in their position the right of anyone to request for them that right is guaranteed but if you look at what Serap is suing us, what Serap sued for section 5 and section 7, uh, which I just want to read, um, so beca- before I ask the question um, that's on my mind, uh, section 5 says that where a public institution receives an application for access to information, and the information is, and the institution is of the view that another public institution has greater interest in the information, the institution uh, to which the application is made may within three days but not later than seven days after the application is received transfer the application and if necessary the information to the other public institution in which in this in which case the institution transferring the application shall give written notice of the transfer to the applicant which notice shall contain a statement informing the applicant that such decision to transfer the application can be received by the court. Basically, this is saying that Ministry of Finance is saying we don't have the details in court. Yes. The Ministry of Finance ought to have transferred it. We ought to have informed the applicant within three days that we have transferred this year application to another ministry that we feel has the details to your question. Right. And within seven days, that information ought to have been provided. Why is this difficult to do in a country like Nigeria? Of course, um, so that's the first question. Of course, there are some issues. You could say, oh, this is um, confidential. It is secret. It is security. But these are not security-related details. These are not confidential. This should not be confidential. It's not a national security question. So why is it difficult? Perhaps at budget. Maybe you have gotten, you've written for freedom of information concerning a particular document and it has not been released. What are the excuses that you have received so far from these ministries? Yes, thank you so much uh, for your question, counsel, your questions rather. Uh, the first question is why is it difficult, you know, to have this Freedom of Information Act provisions enforced? And, you know, you know as, as well as I do that there is always the, the challenge or the problem of overriding state interest, you know, as a doctrine of governance in, in, in government, uh, government studies and uh, political science generally. 
However, the, the, the idea that these interests supersede the right to know and supersede the principle of justice is, is always going to be a, an argument that has push and pull factors. Perhaps because, you know, we are legal practitioners, yourself and myself, so we understand that the ultimate aims of the law are to ensure a just and equitable society. And where the state exercises powers that go beyond that, the state is said to act, you know, in, in the form of a tyranny. And that is antithetical to the principles of justice. So, you know, right off the bat, I would say that there is really no excuse to this behavior by government agencies. And this should be looked to, this should be seen within the context of the huge powers that the state has at, as, at its disposal in the first place. So I'll say that the, the time itself, you know, given the three day period is, is very short and it is unusable, it is unreasonable rather for that period of time to, to be applied, seen as you know, it even takes time for, you know, for the service of processes to be carried out. You, 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 you can say much more than I, but even to serve processes sometimes takes several days, you know, not to talk of transmitting this sort of response, you know, that you are transferring the jurisdiction to an agency that has superior interest. So I would say that there really is no excuse. And if need be, this matter should be pursued accordingly. Uh, secondly, um, your, your second question, I'm sorry, could you please uh, repeat the second question? Yeah, so I was initially asking that why is this difficult in the first place for, you know, to get this done? And uh, secondly, I was also, you know, I, I read from the um, section one that guarantees the right of all citizens to request for information from public oh, institutions. Yes, yeah, yes. from public institutions. Yes, budget, budget experience. Yes, exactly. So perhaps you might want to tell us your experience. What, what's what are the what are the excuses that you have gotten uh, from these public institutions? Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. You know, uh, let, let me just uh, conclude uh, the first question. So the the reason why these these excuses are there is because the the nature of our federal system, the nature of you know our government in Nigeria, is one that gives executive extremely wide powers. Uh, a very popular Twitter account uh, that's held by. Uh, PhD holder called uh, Ayo Shogunro. Uh, he has, you know, several times explained how, from his observations, I think his PhD thesis was about the excessive discretionary powers of the federal government in Nigeria. And, you know, that gives an insight into how the government thinks and how it operates. This is coming from a history of having been dominated by colonial power that, you know, carried out its governance in a very centralized fashion. Hmm. And you know, post uh, so pre nineteen ninety nine, there were moves to bring about a more equitable constitution, but those uh, efforts were scuttled, and then we have the constitution that we have today. So there is always the desire by government officials, by Nigerian government officials, to grant the government excessive powers, and that's why these things happen as they do. Going to budget experience, you know, personally, I have uh, assisted. You know, TRACA, that's a budget sister organization that focuses on the evaluation and confirmation of the uh, activity of, you know, government agencies in capital projects. You know, we've written letters a couple of times and we have had responses by federal government agencies saying that, oh, they do not have this kind of information. And we would respond by invoking the sections of the Freedom of Information Act. And every single time, you know, we've been successful in them providing us with the information that we are seeking. We've not had, we've really not, to my knowledge, have we had any pushback from government agencies, federal government agencies, you know, to provide this information. What we have had challenges with is state government agencies in providing information where we come under the Freedom of Information Act. And I'm sure you are aware of why this is, is the case I would, for our I, listeners. I, I would just, I'm yeah. not aware, perhaps you want to tell us Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Right. For, for our listeners, the, the issue is one of jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And the jurisdiction is principally whether or not the Freedom of Information Act applies to the states mm. or the states have to domesticate the act before it applies. But so in, 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 in legal studies, there's always the question of jurisdiction right. as it concerns 
coordinate arms of government. Right. States, federation, and the local governments in quotes are, are, are governments of coordinate jurisdiction. It's just the federal government has certain exclusive powers over which it exercises uh, you know, control. But in theory, these three levels are actually of coordinate, uh, so, coordinate so, powers. So, Viola, you are saying that the Freedom of Information Act is not a status that of general application that applies to both states, local government, and the federal government. Is that what, uh, is that what you're yes, saying? Uh, in fact, I will, even, I will even go as far as saying that there's current, there are currently two conflicting court of appeal decisions that say, on one hand, the Freedom of Information Act does not apply to the states. On the other hand, the Freedom of Information Act applies to the states without them having to domesticate the act. Mm -hmm. And this is actually very bad for for Nigerian jurisprudence, one, and it is also very bad for the improvement of transparency and, you know, by extension, accountability in the Nigerian space. Because this sends very, very mixed signals, not just to Nigerians, but also to the international community and even to private investors, right. you know, to, to, to the effect that if the Supreme Court does not lay a consequential judgment on whether or not this act applies to the states, that we will be, in essence, in limbo in Nigeria concerning the act. Hmm. All righty. Uh, so we've been speaking with Viola Kwaga, senior researcher at Budget, and we're talking about Chaluts. Since Bacha's death in 1998, several loots have been repatriated from most countries in Europe and America. And, uh, well, just last week, the Federal High Court in Abuja gave a ruling demanding that the Minister of Finance provide details of what the court tagged about five million United States dollar budget loot recovered since then, and uh, if if you if you go down um, if you if you look at countries from which this uh, uh, loot has been recovered, you'd uh, find that we've recovered from Switzerland, from Jersey Island, uh, from the United States, and then uh, another uh, you know country. Uh, quite a tongue twister sometimes. Liechtenstein, it's called, right? Uh, so, the focus of this conversation really, uh, you know, is what exactly has this fund been used for? Can we account for this fund? And that's what Setup has gone to court for. They've gotten a ruling, a judgment in their favor to say, provide this information to Setup. We're trying to track down these funds. We'd like you to join the conversation. In just a few minutes, you get the opportunity to do so on the Take the Mic segment, uh, which comes up just 10 minutes. Uh, uh, that's exactly right, at 10 minutes past 10, which is just about uh, some three to four minutes away from now. You join the conversation. Let us know what you think of this loot and uh, what government has said in the past or we've heard, uh, you know, like Viola referenced, uh, you know, rumored use of this font. So we'd like to get your thoughts on that. Also, you can do that via social media. We're streaming on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash left from 1039. You can drop your comments there or you go straight to Twitter where you can use the hashtag Love and Morning Show and drop your comments as well. Twitter at Love and 1039. That's Love and underscore radio. Love and underscore radio on Twitter. Love FM radio on Instagram. And of course, uh, on Facebook, Love FM 1039. Would love to hear from you. Just in a moment, we'll take your calls and contributions as we continue mm. the conversation with Viola Quagga. Viola, uh, so again, the attention is what exactly have we used this morning for? Can you, you know, in your view and in your monitoring of this funds, would you say we've done enough, we've benefited from this loot? Five billion United States dollars, uh, you know, is no little fund. It's no little money. It's no small money in local parlance. Yes, I, I think there there has been some some level of usage. Uh, a a fraction of that five billion dollars. I mean, it's it's even controversial as to how much the money really is. Right. But a fraction of that money has been used by the Buhari administration. I, I think I recall twenty twenty where the federal government officially stated that the $311 million recovered you know, from, uh, from the Abacha regime has been, was, would be used for the second Niger Bridge, 
the Lagos Ibadan mm. and Abuja mm. Kaduna Kano Expressways, if mm. I'm not mistaken, and then some power projects in the country. But this is just $311 million out of an alleged $5 billion U.S. dollars. So it's very difficult to say whether these, these monies have been used accordingly. And it would be interesting to find out, or it would be interesting to follow the case of Serap and the details that they are requesting from the Ministry of Finance really as to where these monies go to and what the procedure is for the receipt of these funds. It would interest you to note that Nigeria has, you know, relatively comprehensive legislation, regulation for the handling of uh, money laundering issues, uh, anti-money laundering issues, uh, the combating of the financing of terrorism, uh, the proceeds of crime, and guidelines by the central bank, you know, the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit, and a lot of them, you know, exist. But as, as is the case with laws in Nigeria, the challenge isn't with the existence of the laws, but with their implementation. Is the government able to, you know, go after those, in quotes, politically exposed persons that may be very high-ranking government officials mm. and send that signal that the government is completely intolerant of corruption? I think the Biden administration did very well by signing two pieces of consequential legislation, the Proceeds of Crime Act and the uh, Money Laundering Prohibition Act, you know, which repealed the 2011 uh, Money Laundering Act, and really broaden the scope and the definition of who a politically exposed person is in the first case. The central bank as well has uh, some significant uh, regulation uh, under the term, I think the guidance notes on uh, money laundering, the guidance notes on anti-money laundering and combating financing of terrorism regulations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of these regulations are for other financial institutions, which the CBN defines as deposit money banks, commercial banks, and a slew of guidelines and policies that these banks have to undertake, you know, for suspicious transactions and what have you. Right. So I will say that, yeah. Yeah, okay, just, just before just before you continue, let's uh, bring the listener into the conversation because uh, it's 10 minutes past 10 now and uh, it's time for Take the Mic. Take the Mic. We want to hear you. We want to hear you. Hear you. On, on, on the Low FM Morning Show. Alrighty, time for you to take the mic. The mic is yours. Grab it right now and join the conversation. The number to call is 0703 and 909 That's 0703-227-7338 and 909-555-1039. You can also send in WhatsApp messages via uh, that number 0703-227-7338. It would love to hear from you. You can drop your comments as well on Facebook or streaming live, facebook.com for slash lifem1039 and uh, you can also do so via Twitter with the hashtag lifem morning show Twitter at lifem underscore radio and of course drop your comments as well you find a post on Instagram where you can drop your comment at lifem radio we definitely would love to hear from you keep them course coming as we continue the conversation we'll take your course alongside yes sir well, I, I wanted to ask um, I wonder why Sarah did not um, request for even those recovered during Abdul Salami's uh, era because <laughs> obviously when we after Abacha we had Abdul Salam and during his period uh, the nation newspaper reports that um, during that era in 1999 they have 750 million dollars uh, uh, during that era we also had you know the paper goes on to you know give a breakdown of um, loot allegedly you know well is it alleged now or actually recovered during a bus and era you have 1.2 billion dollars recovered in 2002 you have 149 million from jesse island in uk in 2003 you have 500 million recovered in 2004 from switzerland and another 458 dollars recovered in, two, in 2005 from switzerland and uh, it goes on during the Northern administration even the Buhari's administration, several millions of you know dollars recovered. Yeah. Just before uh, you comment on that, Viola, let's take uh, this call. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning, Mr. Kingsley. Hi, good morning to you. Uh, this is um, Emmanuel. You're welcome, yes, Emmanuel. 
uh, I want to agree with our analyst that this is just one of the uh, and numerous steps to be taken in order to hold this past government accountable for how they spend the battle. And my question specifically is, you know, if someone can say I spend a certain amount of money on constructing a second Niger bridge and other things. My question is, is there a way to know for sure that indeed a certain amount of money was really spent on that project? So I can say that I spend a certain time to buy uh, something. Why indeed I only spend a time now? Is there any way we can do you? Know? That what they will claim that they spend is actually what they spend. That's my question. Hmm. Thank you so much for your question. Appreciate that. Um, I suppose that's why documentation happens. Uh, but we'll just let Viola respond yeah. to that. Viola, so I'm sure you got the question from the listener. Uh, so I'm sorry, it was a little thing, so I didn't... Oh, okay. Get it, uh, so please. he wants to know that, you know, beyond what an administration says they spent mm. uh, from the loot, executing certain projects, can we know for sure uh, if that was the amount really spent on that? How can the people know, how can the Nigerians know for sure that this is true or not? I mean, Nigerians can never really know <laughs> for sure. There is always the possibility that the government, really in, in, in any country, is concealing information from its citizens. And uh, I'm sure you know our listeners are aware that there's a legislation called the Official Secrets Act, and the government can designate certain information as an official secret, and it has no obligation to disclose that. Other jurisdictions, the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, Canada, and many countries within the European Union have legislation that covers the disclosure of certain government secrets. There's a time period within which official secrets, uh, state secrets, are will be released, you know, automatically. And of course, it could be a period of 10, 15, 20 years after which, you know, that particular government that carried out that action has already gone. But the information will be put out nonetheless. So do we need to start thinking of asking or demanding or passing a bill for the development of a framework or a law for the disclosure of state secrets after a particular amount of time? Or do we continue to go after it in this way? Whatever method or strategy that we choose, there, there, there is a high possibility, there's a high likelihood that a lot is being concealed, a lot is being kept, a lot is being hidden from the Nigerian people by the government for one reason or the other. But I think the actions of new organizations and civil society to continue to prod, to push, to ask questions, you know, is, is going to yield, I think, some substantial benefits, at least for the development of transparency. Maybe right. for emphasis on this particular question, and which is something which we spoke about, uh, you know, and we didn't maybe emphasize or dwell on that, uh, before the listener popped the question, would be, you know, going back to the judgment, at, at least some of these details, if you want to know for sure, should be, uh, you know, for want of better words, resident with the Ministry of Finance, for example, who would disburse these funds, right, uh, with the Attorney General who would have signed these deals, because when uh, some of these uh, funds, when, in fact, all of the funds, when they were being returned, fresh agreements were signed, especially, for example, in August 2022, the federal government signed a fresh agreement with the United States government uh, for the return of over $23 billion uh, looted by Abacha, right? So when this happens, you find that um, there are documents or there should be documents available with the Office of the Attorney General, for example, and then the Ministry of Finance uh, would eventually disburse these funds if, if they're going to be used for certain projects. Isn't that a good place to look, you know, if you're going to emphasize in response to this question, uh, like the judges, like the judgment states that the Ministry of Finance provides details to Serap. Absolutely, it's, it's definitely a good place to look. And you know, you you normal logical procedure of investigation, you go from the known to the unknown. Mm. So what 
what what is the position of existing legislation and existing policy and how do we work our way from there to where we want to go that is names dates accounts and figures these are like the specific questions that need to be answered and how can that logically progress from putting requests to the Ministry of Finance, the Attorney General of the Federation, perhaps even the head of the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit or the special unit established within uh, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission on uh, uh, money laundering. And then, of course, the relevant directorates in the relevant agencies as prescribed by the Proceeds of Crime Bill and Proceeds of Crime Act. And, you know, those organizations are the EFCC, ICTC, NDLEA, NAPTIP, NAPDAC, the Customs Service, Code of Conduct Bureau, the Nigerian Police Force, DSF, you know, several of them. So these are the these are the places, these are the institutions, the agencies that need to have these questions, you know, uh, presented to them. Uh, Bala, I, I, you mentioned the Official Secret Act, which was, I think, established and, I mean, uh, enacted in 19, 1911. Oh, if I'm not mistaken, that's uh, way, way, way back. And till now, most government officials are still using that as a way to, you know, hold documents or details or information that should be in the public. And that's why the Freedom of Information Act was enacted. So I'm a bit, um, I'm a bit trying to wrap my head around the Official Secret Act when it's not a client privilege issue or um, issues relating to national security. This issue is how was the loot recovered from different countries? How was this spent? Why should it, and that's why I asked my initial question, why should it take this while? Why should it take this long for details? Or why is it even difficult to release such information in the first place? Yeah, so, you know, the I guess uh, maybe I should have prefaced my statement by saying that I, I do not expect the government to hide under the cover of the Official Secrets Act, mm -hmm. but I was giving a, a scenario in which it would be possible for the government to refrain from providing information. I, I, I totally agree with you in the studio, uh, your point saying that this, this information is actually non-contentious and it is non-controversial. You know, the, the money is Nigeria's public trust. It is not does not belong to any government official, but you know the the challenge with government and governance in Nigeria generally is a complete lack of understanding and an unwillingness by government officials to understand that government exists at the pleasure of citizens. But because of the peculiar nature of our political structure, of our social norms, of our social systems. A conversation that you know is beyond the scope of this present uh, discussion there is a there is always the the lack of engagement by government officials and i mean we had to pass an act we had to pass the freedom of information act you know to compel the federal government to provide information and it is still being battled by the state mm. you know to show you that there's significant pushback because the government believes itself to be too powerful to believes itself to be too powerful to have to provide this information, you know, to citizens. And that demonstrates a complete misunderstanding of the role of government, you know, in, in the twenty first century and in this democratic dispensation. Hmm. So I will simply say that it is it is a case of, of, of an abuse of power. It is a case of an unwillingness of the government to understand its 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 purpose and its function as a means to provide you know redistribution of wealth and to ensure public order and safety you know in a in, in a nutshell hmm. all righty uh, we're taking calls and contributions we have time for one or two before we close uh the discourse this morning on the law for morning show so you can call 0703-227733 on 0909-555-1039 again 0703-227733 Three three eight and zero nine zero nine five 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 one zero three nine numbers to call to join the conversation or you drop a comment via Facebook uh, and uh, let's know what you think of uh, the butter loots and uh, the recent judgment by the Federal High Court in Abuja demanding the Ministry of Finance provide uh, details of the spending of those loots and all that has been recovered so far since 1999 since the time of President 
uh, former President Olusegun Basanjo till the uh, administration of President Muhammadu Buhari, who just left uh, May 29. So keep them calls coming in. We'll take uh, some more of your thoughts. And uh, just tracking back to this judgment, uh, well, again, it was the, the judgment was on the 3rd. It's a 12th day today. It'll be nice to hear from Serap if they've gotten uh, these details. It's right. it's past seven days already, and that seven days would have elapsed two days ago. That would be on Monday. Um, so, but it's been interesting to hear from Serap if they've gotten this. But uh, I don't know that as part of that judgment by just Moto Shaw, uh, something was mentioned as to you know the failure of the Ministry of Finance. Uh, complying to the judgment and uh, some, somewhere there it did state that uh, well I, I did tell you about the fact that the ministry the judge uh, does justice on motor shower that did say that the ministry cannot use a blanket statement that was not in possession of the said records of about five billion dollars a bachelor loot uh, you know sought by setup uh, but the, the other part also says that the excuse by the ministry of finance that is that the ministry has searched its records and the details of the exact public funds stolen by bacha and how the funds have been spent and not held by the ministry and the excuse has no leg in view of Section 7 of the Freedom, Freedom of Information Act, and that's uh, part of the ruling, uh, by the way, uh, of uh, Justice Omoto Show. Uh, well, just to put that in there also, uh, Bayala, I'm not sure if you saw that part of the judgment, uh, that the ministry had already said, okay, we'll search our records, we do not even know where it is, right? Uh, we, we don't have a record. And we, does this tell you a lot about the process, the mm -hmm. system in That's Nigeria? Crazy. Yeah, it, it, it's, it certainly does, and it's not very surprising. Uh, I mean, in fairness to the Minister of Finance, I I would not be surprised to know that, uh, say, the special unit within the EFCC or the Attorney General's office does not share information. It is common knowledge that Nigerian government agencies work in silos. You know, there is a constant refrain by highly placed government uh, government officials that ministries, agencies need to work together. In my personal work and consultancy, you know, I have had calls to interview government officials in different federal government agencies. And, you know, time and time again, one thing they complain about is that there's really a lack of coordination between even agencies within the same ministry, you know, not to talk of agencies and ministries that belong to uh, quite distinct uh, jurisdictions. So I, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, I would not take that as an excuse, nonetheless. And I sincerely hope that this new administration, uh, President Bola Ametinu's administration, works to go against that sort of notion. Uh, in fact, one way that I think he has shown it might not be business as usual is the establishment, or, or rather a recommendation was given to him to establish a presidential uh, I think it was called the Presidential Action Unit or something within the presidency, you know, to ensure that where the government has specific, you know, lines of action it wants to take, there's a unit that reports directly to the president that can ensure these actions are carried out. Whether or not that would, uh, you know, have problems in terms of the, the role and superiority of the ministers is another question. Mm -hmm. But I think that this government may be interested in taking a couple of steps forward as regards government action. Yeah. Uh, sorry, um, Viola, just a final question for you. Uh, what are your solutions to all of this? Because we cannot just all be looking at the challenges, the issues. What would you recommend for public institutions, especially uh, government agencies? Re realizing also that even agencies that have issues with government, that work for the government, that are not public institutions, are not government institutions, also have a duty you know, to provide information when they are asked. So the, the, the process of development, the process of societal development is one that, that is not linear. And oftentimes change comes very, very slowly. In fact, policy change tends to come incrementally, as we are told uh, by public policy experts. But having worked in development for you know, a little time I have spent in it, I've noticed that the, the role of the media can never be understated. And they are key because not only do they act as information carriers, but they act as framers of conversation. 
Uh, there's a very popular book written by a very well-known um, cognitive scientist called Manufacturing Consent. And one of his principal arguments was that uh, the United States media was basically manufacturing the way that Americans thought about conflict and thought about governmental action, I think sometime in the uh, 80s. So I will you know, start off my comments by saying the media does need to do more, especially in terms of educating the public and presenting these facts in a way to compel action, not to carry out illegal action, of course, but for Nigerians to ask questions, for Nigerians to be informed, for Nigerians to know how much has been done already and what the current state of the matter is, whether there are conflicting statements by the government and you know, even liaising with the government itself, uh, there are rooms in which you know, ordinary citizens cannot enter, but media organizations definitely would have a foot in the door. You know, what, what can they do better to engage with government officials? And you know, even in my conversations with investigative journalists, you know, a couple of whom are my acquaintances, I've seen that their own actions oftentimes tend to bring substantial fruit. You know, one of them was telling me that government officials oftentimes are very willing to speak to them because there are quite a few that are not happy with the way things, you know, are going on and would want to give out information but may not want to do so on record. You know, that's where the, the expertise of the investigative journalists would have to come in and know how to present that information. Secondly, I would say that the, the role of civil society organizations you know, like Serap, like Budget, especially those that work in the transparency and accountability space, those that work, you know, in public financial management in general, must be able to create platforms where citizens can engage with the government. Uh, the way civil society organizations are, are, are created or, and how they operate is such that they, can, they have the convening power to bring government officials into a room. Uh, not too long ago, Budget was fortunate to organize a session that had the attendance of the budget, the director general of the budget office of the federation, Dr. Ben Akabuezi. And, you know, we had civil society organizations and grassroots organizations represented at that event. And, you know, they, they put certain questions to him. Uh, of course, you know, there was uh, some uh, slight uh, challenge, you know, in responding to the questions. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, everybody was, was, was happy that they were able to air their views and get a response, you know, from government uh, officials. Bayala, Thirdly, yeah. The, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Bayala. Well, we're pressed for time and we've got yeah. to go, but uh, it's been an amazing conversation with you. Thank you so much uh, for being on the program and for shedding light on uh, this, especially from, uh, you know, research point of view and uh, the work you do with budget. Bayala Kwaga is a senior researcher, budgets, and uh, well, he's been on the discourse discussing the Bachelor Lutz this morning and the recent court judgment uh, requesting or demanding the Ministry of Finance provide, uh, to provide details of the $5 billion spending since 1999. And uh, thank you so much again, Bayala, for being here. Thank you so much, Kingsley, and thank you, uh, Council, for your erudite questions and comments. All right, thank you. Appreciate that. Nice. All right, so there you go. We leave things there. Go on a short break now. When we get back, we we'll switch gears to Industry Hub. An industry Hub this morning, local ma meter manufacturing companies under the Meter Manufacturers and Assemblers Association of Nigeria have kicked against being effectively shut off from meters production and importation by the new rules enunciated by the Transmission Company of Nigeria. Let's talk about that and a lot more on how this affects you as an electricity consumer in Nigeria in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> 